In, in my talk today, I'm going to do two things. The first one is an overall introduction to the topic area uh, for the benefit of everyone here. And then secondly, to report on a teaching fellowship uh, project that I was engaged in over the last few years. So practice-based education, we all know because we're here, has a valuable role to play in higher education and particularly in shaping our future professionals, workers and members of society. So what's PBE? Well, we'll go with the simple version first. It basically is what it says it is. It's an approach to education grounded in the preparation of workers, professionals, members of society for their future roles. So this is what Stephen Biller has to say, among many other things, and you'll hear more from him later, is that the work of the professionals has become far more demanding and complex. And here's what he says about what it needs to do that. So for instance, he's got, it needs professional dispositions as well as knowledge. He'll talk much more, I'm sure, about dispositions. So why use PBE in higher education? Here's a lot of reasons. I'm not going to read them all out, but just have a little look there. What sorts of things do you do that uh, resonate with this long list? Here's another way of thinking about practice-based education is that it aims to give students more than propositional theoretical knowledge and the technical skills that permit them to do their jobs. Stephen Kemmers argues that it also aims to give students a taste for and enduring curiosity about and a sustained commitment to confronting the problems of practice. It aims to awaken them to the demands of professional practice, work and life. This is from our book from the last summit, which we're launching today, uh, in absence of the final book, but at least you've got a picture of it, so that'd be nice. <coughs> However, uh, there's a lot of very valuable arguments and uh, discussions from the last summit that have been captured in that book. So understanding PBE, you could take a simple view and call it education for practice. You could, of course, make, have a very more complicated view and talk about principles and models and what sort of underlying principles there are uh, and how it might be translated into educational models. I don't think it matters which model that you use. I think what matters is that you embody it as educators and your students live it as learners. So I think one of the things that I'd like to argue very strongly is that even though it might be simple, to say we're educating people for practice. We can't be complacent. So if you say just that label, it says everything, which is nice, but maybe nothing. So what is it that we need to do? And on the other hand, acknowledging that many different models can be used, we don't want anything goes either. So where does the rigor come in without jumping into a straitjacket? So we have a challenge in front of us as what PBE is and how we're going to deliver it or enact it. And so all of these different areas here, the definition, philosophy, pedagogy, the scope of its implementation and the levels, including at the curriculum level, are very important. And I think the challenge is very beneficial. Here's one of the reasons why. I think the worst thing you can do is actually say, this is it, this is it. Have you been to conferences where somebody stands up and says, this is the way, the way to do it? And you think, yeah, but I don't want to do it that way. Or my people need it differently, or it depends. Uh, then I think that's what we need to cope with the depends. So now moving on to my ALTC fellowship, I'd like to acknowledge ALTC in its many iterations, past, present, future, uh, in terms of their support for that program. So in pursuing my fellowship, one of the exciting things, or in fact confounding things I did, was where to start. 
And one of the very big difficulties was the many, many definitions of things. So first of all, I spent quite a bit of time identifying these four core phenomena that were part of my fellowship, part of the notion and the practice of PBE. But then I said, can, can, but was confounded by many definitions, many concepts, much overlap between those. I mean, in a way, practice is everything, and pedagogy is practice, and education is practice, and curriculum is practice, and how much difference is high-level pedagogy from curriculum, and etc. So, where do you go from there? One of the things was to focus on these four core phenomena and say, how do I want to conceptualise and use them? And in order to do this, uh, I had an interesting discussion with Stephen Chemis around capitalisation. And the capitalisation of the four key terms put those words and those ideas into the area of a domain, a domain of knowledge, a domain of study, a field of study. And then secondly, I was identifying that the notion of a small p pedagogy, for instance, was about the realisation of in the local sphere of these words. So how do we understand pedagogy, the domain, and how do we enact pedagogy in a setting? So let's look at these four domains. Here's a definition that we could use for pedagogy. Can I just say uh, the PowerPoints will be on the web later? So nobody needs to write it frantically if you want to write it all. So here we have pedagogy and focusing on a social practice and looking at the development of individuals and encompassing a, a variety of key elements such as the philosophical, political, moral, technical and practical, practical dimensions of what pedagogy is all about. So a person studying the field would hopefully look at many of those areas. And here's some key social dimensions that were identified through the process. Can I draw your attention to the fact that in your folders you have one of these, which is the um, brochure produced for my fellowship, and these are all listed. So here are the key social dimensions I identified as being part of pedagogy the field. Again, quoting Stephen Kimmis, he looks at a broad definition of education and coming from a teacher education background, he starts with children. And look at these various dimensions and expectations of education. Look at the motivation behind it being for the good of the person as well as good of humankind. So to focus on university education, we can think of university education through this definition. Particularly emphasising how this education extends beyond the time and place and intention of university curricula and includes preparation for the occupation as well as ongoing development uh, throughout the person's life. <laughs> Sorry. Here's a, an idea of what we can interpret by curriculum. A very broad definition. And if you see, a, again, the overlap between some of the other terms that we've already used. Practice is a, a difficult one because, as I said, it overlaps all of the others. But in one model that a colleague and I developed, we looked at practice as being the doing, knowing, being and becoming of occupations. So being right there in the midst of being a practitioner, of doing practice, knowing about it, knowing for it, knowing through it, and becoming more of self as well as more of self as profession. So the term practice, as you can see, is about social practice. And this is very interesting down the bottom. Um, practice is inherently, I believe, situated and temporarily, temporarily located 
in local settings, life worlds and systems. It is embodied, agential, socially historically constructed, and it is grounded and released in metaphor, interpretation and narrative. <coughs> well, we could spend about two hours or so on that slide and unbundle mm -hmm. it and come to a deeper <coughs> understanding of it. But it's trying to en encapsulate uh, a broad idea of practice as a field of study. Another interesting, fascinating and liberating uh, area that I examined in the fellowship was the difference between practice and practices. Because when you get to practices, it liberates you to think in different ways about the whole field. And looking at practices being customary activities associated with the profession. Because if we say we're educating for practice, we don't want to just educate for a theoretical idea. We also want to educate for the real <coughs> work that the person will be doing, the real uh, walk that they're going to walk. So in this interpretation, practice-based education is a pedagogical perspective, a curriculum framework, and a set of pedagogical practices. But it's not any one of those separately. It's all of them together. And in doing this, we have to say, Partly this is to understand practice-based education, but very much also it's to enact it. What sort of framework do we want to construct? Uh, how active and dynamic? You can't actually see it so well on this screen, but there's a lot of swirling colours uh, in the background inside uh, just about here. Um, but also to say, what are the uh, relevant set of pedagogical practices that suit this circumstance? And how do we think of practice-based education as a pedagogical perspective. What pedagogical perspective do we adopt in uh, implementing this project? So then we move from the capitalisation to the small letters and come to the realisation or realisations, how it can be enacted. And these are the sorts of things we need to deal with now. This is very interesting that we can think of some strategies as being field-owned. Do we teach differently in health compared to teacher education? In engineering, for instance, uh, in philosophy, in history? Uh, how do we understand the ways that we can teach in those areas? What is recognised through practice in those areas? But also knowing that it can be personally owned. If people say, this is my model, this is my pedagogy, we really want to identify that that's uh, a useful way of thinking about it. And I like this one as well, that we can think of uh, the way we realise things is uh, to think of nouns as well as verbs. So the doing as well as the understanding. So a set of pedagogical practices or pedagogies are the teaching and learning strategies that we adopt within the programme. And here's a, a key list that I believe re, uh, relates very strongly to uh, practice-based education. Some people may have all or some or few or even others in their curriculum. <coughs> so in terms of implementing it or realising the curriculum, to interpret it conceptually, how do you understand practice-based education? What does it mean? Uh, to situate it locally, what is the, the discipline, the profession, the university, the rural, the remote, the uh, metropolitan, whatever the situation is, uh, what's your staff-student ratio, uh, how competitive is it for every placement with other universities around, many, many things are about local situation. And realised particularly is what is it for the local realisation, how can we specifically address that? So in your diagram, uh, sorry, in your brochure, this diagram is there, and you can see that this is trying to bring all of those things together. You notice that relationships are right in the beginning, particularly identifying teachers, learners, and others, and different experiences being part of that uh, environment, and 
an unending circle of arrows because uh, nothing starts and stops particularly, you want to keep uh, moving along, and locating it within the context. So in summary, promoting good practice-based education to me is first of all understanding practice and the practice of practice-based education as well and looking at it as these three different uh, dimensions and then creating relationships in the design and operationalization of the curriculum. So, thank you very much.